which is based on Ethereum. Um, the sort of single liner is that what we've created is, uh, is an unhackable ballot box. And for everybody here, I'm sure you're instantly, you know, the connotations are running straight towards how that's possible. But of course, with a distributed ledger, we're able to secure the vote or the result of the vote in ways that um, have never before been possible. Um, and this sort of all started for us with something called My Vote in Melbourne. That's where I live at the moment, um, M-I-V-O-T-E. And it's a democratic movement which has a terrific constitution and operating model and philosophies in respect to how do we improve our democratic process. And there are lots of arms and legs and attached to this sort of, this idea. Um, but when I got involved, it was really about starting to think about how we could enable uh, a conversation with the Australian constituency um, that is immediate, that is frequent, um, that is accountable. And of course, the, uh, the blockchain, broadly speaking, offers a good opportunity uh, to do that. So in February, we launched uh, MyVotes blockchain-based voting system. And since then, we've been iterating and looking at commercializing this tech around the world as Horizon State. Uh, we're currently in the middle of an ICO. Now, look, it's, it's certainly not a status or a Bancor level ICO, uh, far, far from it. But we have raised around 700,000 Australian dollars so far, which is um, you know, a really great result for our team. Compared to a traditional seed round, it's really, really positive for us. It gives us a good amount of runway, and it, it, it helps ensure we can keep our options open in respect to the continued development of this, this uh, tamper-proof ballot box and improving democracy around the world. And so, really what uh, this offers for both governments and uh, enterprise and NGOs is the opportunity to engage their constituency, be that staff or citizens or members, um, and do so with immediacy and regularity, um, and do so in a secure way that's cheaper and quicker. Um, now, if we think about, for example, the, uh, the Australian postal vote that's currently underway for same-sex marriage, it's costing us as taxpayers about $122 million, which is completely absurd. Uh, it's taken two months to orchestrate, and we've seen, you know, in a very insecure way, postal votes left out in the rain and so forth. So this kind of tech means that we can now, for example, supplant uh, government initiatives to do that sort of thing uh, at far reduced cost, 15 times cheaper, and we can do so at least 10x faster. Uh, and we can do so in respect to the security of the result uh, with perfect security. So it's, it's a big deal. It's for the first time in history, thanks to blockchain, this sort of thing is possible. Um, and we're really, really proud to be working on a blockchain product that is not only pretty cool, uh, maybe not sexy, but it's cool. It's also very, very important. Like We've got a, a genuine um, opportunity here to impact the lives of people not only around Australia as taxpayers, but in developing mm -hmm. nations as we find ways to eradicate corruption in our election results uh, and generate true equality um, and uh, genuine sort of outcomes. So that probably sums it up. Uh, we're going to be around all night. Uh, our, our head of R&D, one of our co-founders, Dan Crane, is over here, so uh, in, the, in the red shirt. If anybody wants to talk about what we're doing, if you'd like to get involved uh, on a technical level in terms of uh, future development, if you'd like to be involved in the ICO, or if you just have questions, um, but we're going to be around all night, so we'll probably be mostly near the beer, but come and grab us and uh, we can talk more then. Thanks, Matt, James. Um, so, yeah, we're always looking for sponsors, so uh, I'll, do, I'll do the plug for the, for the next event, even though I'm not organising that one. But, uh, yeah, if you're interested in sponsoring, contact myself. Um, I, don't know who, I don't know who's doing the next one, whether it's Luke or Nathan or... Or ben, um, but maybe maybe you could just put a message on on the meetup. Uh, that'd be good. Um, so first speaker is uh, Jeremy Lamb. Um, now Jeremy Lamb's been in the blockchain space for many years now, and working with financial institutions and trying to make uh, blockchain real. So we're, and he's um, uh, currently working for MEC Go and heading up the uh, the Plasma build. So you are going to hear it straight from the horse's mouth tonight um, about. What exactly is it? Because I'm, I'm very interested, um, and uh, and what they're up to. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks very much, Nick. <laughs> so first of all, um, I'm Jeremy. I'm the product lead for Miseco, and yeah, we are building the first implementation of Plasma. So we are really happy to talk about it to you tonight. Just to give you a little bit of background, tonight is going to be a non-tech explanation about plasma, so I'm going to do away with all the mathematics, do away with all the mathematics, and I'm going to actually talk about things in a 
common sense English manner. So what that means though is that I may trade off technical accuracy, so I'm sorry to the devs out there, for analogies that are easy to understand. So the other thing to note as well is any errors or omissions are my own only. Tonight we'll be covering a few topics. The first is, well, what is the problem we are trying to solve with the plasma itself? Why, why are we actually even talking about plasma? We will introduce what plasma is, compare it to some other options out there, and explain four central things that I believe, personally, are important about plasma. So, the problem really is that in Ethereum, whether you know it or not, work has been duplicated many, many times. There are 20,000 nodes at the start of October are reported by Ethernodes, and what happens every time a transaction or an event is performed on the Ethereum network, that work is duplicated on every single node. So you might imagine that this causes a bit of a bottleneck when you're actually trying to use Ethereum for a global basis. You need to have thousands, millions, sorry, thousands or millions of transactions occurring every second. You can't have every single node performing that same transaction. So you might think, well, Ethereum isn't really used at the moment. Do we really need such capacity? Well, actually, we have reached these limits a few times, and we actually have seen these limits reached in ICOs, um, for better or for worse. And when that happens, essentially, the Ethereum network gets bottlenecked, and blocks slow down, and the performance degrades. And that's a problem we're trying to solve with plasma and scaling solutions. So what is plasma? So in my opinion, plasma is one of the two most important scaling mechanisms for Ethereum. And by scaling, it means to increase the capacity. The way that we are primarily going to talk about tonight is, of course, plasma. The second is called sharding. And I'll briefly talk about sharding because it is a very, very important piece of technology as well. And the reason is, between plasma and sharding, we think that there might be a massive gain in the capacity of the Ethereum network. So people have said 50 to 100 times of capacity with each. So that cumulative adds up to perhaps thousands or even more um, capacity on the Ethereum network itself. The one thing that is important to know and that we'll highlight tonight is that sharding and plasma can occur independently but also cooperatively together. So that's why it's important. About sharding. So there's only one slide that I've dedicated to sharding and the way that I like to describe sharding to people is it's like taking an English dictionary and then splitting it up in 26 different books. Every book is dedicated to a single letter, and the rules in each book have to be exactly the same. So the alphabetical order in every book has to be strictly the same, the font would be exactly the same, even the paper that is printed on would be exactly the same. <coughs> and this is how Sharding conceptually would work with Ethereum. We basically break Ethereum up in different pieces that can be managed, but the rules at the base layer remains the same. The four things that I'd like to talk about Plasma tonight is that, well, many hands make light work. So how do we split up the work if we have a million transactions, to, a million transactions per second? How are we going to actually split it up so that we don't all have to perform the same work? Once we have performed that work, we need to understand and to actually make sure that the work is performed correctly and we need to be able to prove that work has been completed. So that's the next part, the mathematical proof of actually how we represent that. The third part is observe what is important. And what this essentially means is that we can't have everyone looking at every single transaction all the time. So what is the concept here? How are we going to achieve this? The last part that I'd like to talk about is a game of blockchains. And 
this is actually something that is not plasma specific. In fact, it's actually a central part of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all proof of work blockchains. And it's what makes these blockchains tick. Why do people want to participate? Okay, so many hands make life work. So this is conceptually how plasma could uh, split up the work. Let's take a list of English words. They all start with the letter A, and we'd like to split this work up between different people. So you might also notice, if you were observant, that I've particularly picked words that all start with the letter A. If I wanted to sort a list of words that start with the letter B or C, you could see that that could be shifted to a different shard. So we have this idea of petitioning on sharding and also then splitting up the work on plasma. So let's have a look at this example here. We've got four words, ABBA, ADIV, ARDVACT, and ABACUS. And depending on the second letter, or the preceding letters, we split up the work. So you can see here the first level looks at the second letter, and the third level looks at the third letter. Basically, there is no num there's no limit to how many levels we can have to split up the work. It's just a matter of petitioning the work in a, uh, in, in a procedural way so that then we can keep track of it. The way that we keep track of this work is using a mathematical proof. And basically, before we look at what that proof looks like on a conceptual level, we're not going to look at the mathematics itself, is that when work is complete from the edges, that work flows back from those edges to the root on the trunk. So I've used these particular words because it leads into a concept that's very, very important. So you can see here that the work is at the leaves and it flows to the trunks, uh, sorry, to the branch, to the trunk, and to the root. And the root is Ethereum. And this is really important to understand because in Plasma, all of the security, all the proof, eventually needs to make its way back to Ethereum, and that's the ultimate source of security for a Plasma blockchain. In fact, this concept is so important that I've left some homework for you. So for those who are a little bit curious, have a look at Merkle trees. Merkle trees is one of the most important things that has come up in cryptographic study these years. So Merkle trees and also something called Merkle proofs. So the question here is a little bit philosophical. It's something that is very commonly asked by parents to children. And it's if a tree falls in a forest, does it make a sound? And if we think about this question from a plasma point of view, well, it only makes a sound if it falls in my cabin. So what this actually really means is that if a tree falls on your cabin, it has an economic, economic impact and may have a personal impact to yourself. So in which case, you probably want to observe or keep track of what's going on in that forest. And this also, also applies in plasma. So the idea is we don't need to look at every single thing that always occurs. We should only look at the blockchain elements where there's economic value and in Plasma anyone in the open network can be an observer and check that the blockchain is operating correctly and they can report like a policeman that something isn't occurring correctly on the blockchain and that will have consequences to keep the blockchain secure. So the last thing here is the uh, game of blockchains. So <clears throat> in this game of blockchains, everyone is made to participate together, even though they may not want to. And the best way that I can describe this game is by a childhood game that um, some people may know, and that's called Ring Around the Roses. So I'm not going to sing it, but it goes a little bit something like this. 
ring around the rosies, a pocket full of posies, a tissue, the tissue we all pull down. Cows in the meadows eating buttercups, a tissue, a tissue, we all jump up. And what happens here is a group of children, they may stand in a circle, they may hold hands, they all sing this song together, and on the last line, the, all, the children either curtsy or bow, or fall down and sit on the ground. And the child that is last to sit on the ground loses, and they become the person in the middle, the rosy, and they can't participate. So this same game is actually played out in blockchains, where the participants of the blockchain are encouraged to work together. We all, the, the children all have to sing the song, they all have to play along. If they're not listening, if they're not actually playing by the rules, then they probably lose out and they sit in the middle. And in a blockchain, you, you will lose out, and that means losing money. And this is the game that is being played out by miners in Bitcoin, miners in Ethereum. And it's also the mechanism which is being replicated inside Plasma to get participants to play together in a correct way. So this game has been played out on a global scale. It's been played out 24 hours a day with billions of dollars stored on the blockchain. And that's it for me. Yeah, so um, there's plenty of time for some questions. Plasma, it can be about when we say go. We can have a hearing on Rosie. Just a question about um, when you said something can go wrong and it's up to the computer to report what goes wrong, uh, what was that about? What can go wrong? I think it was a free size, a free size right? So, yeah. in this? Yeah. Okay, so the types of things that can go wrong um, is, for example, if we are operating a blockchain, we want to make sure that it operates continuously. So we have a block every 10 minutes, we have a block every interval, and that's called chain halting, and that's bad behavior, that's one example of bad behavior. So then who reports it for? In Plasma, anyone can report it. So it can be someone who is a, a validator, someone who's actually participating in the blockchain, or it can actually be someone else just observing on the outside. They could be uh, you or me running some applications that are checking is there a reward for reporting or for policing? I, the question was, is there a reward, a reward for um, reporting bad action? No, there isn't directly to the reporter. However, that reporter is likely to have some kind of economic stake in the blockchain that they would be reporting, otherwise they wouldn't bother reporting in the first place. You mentioned that you're building Plasma. Can you really explain a little bit what you're building exactly with Plasma and why we have a, a blockchain Ethereum? Why do we need Plasma around that? Yeah, sure. So, Plasma is being used by OmiseGo to create a new blockchain that has sufficient capacity for global payments. And the reason why we need to have Plasma generally speaking, so away from the MiseGo um, use case, is that there just isn't enough capacity in the current form for Ethereum to allow it to be used for payments of such a grand scale, or for um, smart contracts on such a grand scale. So there's a need for other ways of increasing the capacity of Ethereum, and we've only talked about two, Plasma is one, sharding is another. There are other ways to increase the efficiency and the capacity of Ethereum. Is Plasma a side chain like Raven, or is Plasma a feature that will be incorporated into the Ethereum lab? Plasma is Ethereum. Um, you cannot have Plasma without Ethereum. If you wanted to compare Plasma to a Bitcoin construct that is kind of similar, 
it's like a drivetrain that's closer, so it is like a side chain, but more closely, uh, if you know what a drivetrain is, it's... Uh, it's what's, what's a drivetrain? <laughs> <laughs> so a drivetrain is a additional blockchain that's attached to Bitcoin for scalability. And it has a particular way of bridging Bitcoin to the side chain uh, through a pegging process to economic value. And the reason why I say it's similar is that Plasma achieves this in a similar way. It uses uh, a token of economic value to bind the Plasma blockchain to the Ethereum blockchain. So it, you, you, you can't have Plasma without it. Are there, if, if you put, so you're putting these transactions in blocks on, on I guess, those Merkle trees hanging off Ethereum. It, are, are there any trade-offs you're making? So you're increasing the throughput, but are the trade-offs you're making in the process of making that throughput in, increase in terms of security or, or of, you know, I, I don't know, creating orphans or, or having double spends which aren't detected due to the, the rate at which you're creating these, these side Side, side chain, probably got a better word for it. Yeah, um, so there are trade offs, obviously. Um, the ultimate security is if everyone was checking every single process, every single transaction that, um, that's been generated. And that's the purpose of the root chain, but not for the sub chains or the plasma chains. So, you could say in a way that the security is different. I don't know that you could say it's less, but it certainly is different than the security model of Ethereum. And that's the biggest trade-off that I see. So you, you gain capacity, but the security model is different. So obviously the economics in um, securing each of those sub-blockchains is different. So in order to, to know what is a correct execution of a transaction, you first need to know what is the ordering of all the transactions. So how is that established? That's established as part of the rule of the Plasma blockchain itself. And, and, and how do you get agreement of that across the network? It depends on the implementation of the Plasma blockchain itself. So Plasma as a technology doesn't say how you need to reach agreement. It can actually use the same rules as Ethereum itself. So you could even just have a Plasma blockchain that uses Ethereum consensus and then reports its work back up to Ethereum. And a, a second question. So you've got uh, various agents making partial observations rather than checking everything. Um, what is there by way of uh, ensuring that the, the, the set of partial observations that you're making are adequate to provide you the, the full security that you need. That's part of the game. So there's the game of economics here, and, the, and it's saying in the plasma economic sense that if you have sufficient economic value in that blockchain, then it will attract enough attention to actually secure it. And it only needs just one observer to point out one bad thing, and the, uh, the perpetrator very badly. So. I, I should have warned you that there we get some pretty hard hitting questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just curious, are you guys actually working on sharding as well, or just plasma? Uh, just plasma. So to spin up a plasma node, you would essentially be creating a new Ethereum node with the validators being the underlying, or you have validators, and then you'll be reporting the root to the underlying Ethereum node. Yes, so a, a Plasma blockchain needs to have an Ethereum um, node, full node, so that it can report the proofs back to the Ethereum blockchain. So then um, the next thing that will come after Plasma will be external validator services like Rocket Pool. Yes, and, and so they've started to pop up already. Uh -huh. Yes. How does Plasma defend against a fraudulent actor and a 
validator has been bribed or con contravened in some way? Yep, so it's, it's a similar process of having external uh, observers. So those external observers can look at not only, uh, so we talked about stopping blocks from being formed, so stopping transactions from being processed, but also if validators were colluding together with, with each other, that same behavior can be viewed by these impartial external actors and also other validators themselves who have a greater stake in the network can also raise their hand and say that you know, some, something bad's happening. Yeah, I understand you've been working on this for a while. Do you know when this will be ready to launch? Plenty of time for someone else to that. Yeah, I thought it was going to be the first question. <laughs> um, we, we are working on it actively. We will be revealing our roadmap actually very soon about how we get to Plasma. So like, I don't want to preempt something that Misa Go is going to talk about very soon. It, it's, we'll, we'll be announcing it really soon, actually. Um, so give me some more views. And off, and off the live stream. So I watched on the internet the 30 seconds introduction to Plasma with the cat. With the cat. The, yes, the, and the bird. So if, um, if a validator is detected on a Plasma subnetwork, then apparently the Plasma chain will go poof. Ah, uh, okay. Alright. So what happens to all the data? Right. Okay. So that was a that that was a good good animation. It kind of didn't describe that process very well. So this is getting into some technicalities. But essentially, the way that the, what what that video was trying to show was that if you have a faulty plasma blockchain, you can actually decide to leave it. So the people that uh, have accounts on that faulty blockchain, so that that box picture, um, you know, it was faulty, everyone there can decide, I don't want to take part of this anymore, and we'll move. And when you move, you move back up that tree, so that, that tree diagram there, you move from the leaf back to the, to the parent, and ultimately, you may have to go all the way back up to Ethereum to decide what the current good state is. So that, that, that animation was showing the process of exiting from a faulty blockchain. But it, to, to make it more complete, um, then the, at the end of the animation, you'd go poof, and then you'd actually find yourself inside another box. It'd be like a Matroska doll or something like that. Hi, um, Plasma seems on uh, much more complicated than the Raiden network because uh, it involves a tree of blockchains. Just wondering, what's the benefit of the complexity um, to solve the scalability issue? So the main benefit is that you have on-chain proof of the payments. So when you look at Raiden, you, you are using Raiden in a way that offloads the actual payments themselves or the transactions off the chain. So you only just know when you open it and when you close it that those two endpoints are secure. Um, with Plasma you get the full um, chain of proofs to show that something has occurred correctly. Uh, is there any more questions? Are there any competitors doing anything similar? Well, I guess competitors is probably not a really good word because it's really just an open source community. Um, there, if you want to say competitors, certainly there's other people that uh, other companies that can implement Plasma themselves, um, and there probably are people trying to do that. It'd be great to see if we can maybe collaborate. With Okay, any more questions? One at the back. We'll meet halfway. Uh, for the OMG coin, will you have like 
the minimum stake amount fluid, or will it be static to like kind of control the amount of like uh, honey in the like the network? Because you need like a certain amount to keep it the throughput high, right, for staking. Yep. So the question is um, about staking the OMG token itself. So this is specific to the Omiseko network. In our white paper, we have said if you if you own OMG tokens, you can stake it, place it in a smart contract, and earn fees that are received or generated as part of the OMG network. And the amount of tokens required to form that stake is going to change. It's going to be dynamic in some form, but we haven't fully decided what that formula is going to be. Okay, we might wrap it up there. So uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, and just before we go to the break, so we'll have, uh, we're doing pretty well for time, so we're gonna have like 15 minutes. Um, uh, and then just a show of hands, uh, who's, is, who's the first time to a Pacific Ethereum meetup? Nice. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, maybe another one. Uh, who owns Ether? Well, that's pretty good numbers for a set of theory <laughs> um, Cool. Righto. Well, uh, we'll be back in uh, 15 minutes, so 20 past. Uh, and then we'll... Oh, hang on. One more thing, actually. Uh, do we have the Flux guys here? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we don't, we don't normally do sort of political advocacy, but... Uh, these are, these are blockchain guys, so they're cool. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Yeah, this is a little bit different. Um, so if you were here at the last meetup, you'll know uh, who we are and what we're doing. Um, if you're not, and this is all new, I have to ja thank Jamie Skiller for giving us a great intro here. So Jamie talked a lot about democracy on the blockchain. Uh, that, for us, is part of our project. But right now, what we're really focused on for Flux is getting into Australian Parliament. So I want you to imagine for a second that that at the next New South Wales state election, uh, a blockchain party wins a seat in Parliament, and you, as citizens of New South Wales, get to vote on every single bill that comes before Parliament via your phone and an amazing blockchain-based voting app. That's what Flux is. So we're trying to get registered right now for New South Wales. We're registered federally in several other states, but the laws in New South Wales make it really, really hard, and you actually need 750 signed forms with like your hand, you can't do like a digital signature or anything like that. It has to be a piece of paper and it's insane. So we actually have the members, but obviously getting everyone to sign uh, is a little bit tricky. So since you're all blockchain folk, if you're interested in becoming a member of a party that is a blockchain party and that's only prerogative is better democracy, uh, come and see me. I'll also be over that way and uh, you can sign up and we'd much appreciate your support. So thanks very much for that and thanks, Nick. Cheers. Thank
seats again and uh, grab, a, grab a drink before you come over and we'll get going in a few minutes. Thank you. Make their way to the seats, please. So uh, the uh, people over near the uh, near the beers, can you come over and take a seat, please? So tonight I'm going to talk about programmable money, and this sort of came out of a piece uh, I was doing with FinTech Australia, and um, this was well looking at well, why why do payments on a blockchain? And it's very complementary to what Jeremy was talking about before. Jeremy's talking about technology to enable 
scalable payments on a blockchain, but why would you want to do that? Uh, so I'll, mine's non-technical. Like when I initially put this together, I thought I'd do something technical, but I've, I've paired that back. Um, and uh, yeah, so programmable money. So I won't go too much into money. Um, I've got a few little definitions to kick us off. So uh, money is an accepted medium of exchange for goods and services. So it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, obviously in Australia, that is the Australian dollar which is issued by the Reserve Bank of Australia. Um, it's also a unit of account. Uh, it's also a, a store of value. Uh, now, payment is effectively a transfer of an amount of money from a sender to a receiver. And I'm using non-financial terms here. Um, you could say from a, um, a payer to a payee or a debtor to a creditor, but that all gets confusing. Let's just say someone's sending it, someone's receiving it. Uh, and that's an amount at a particular point in time. And when we talk about token in this sense, uh, we're really saying a token is a right to some asset held by some token issuer. So when I was a young fellow a long time ago and you went to the public swimming pool and you paid your probably 20 cents back then to go and have a swim, uh, they'd issue a token to get through the turnstile. So that was really the right to be able to enter the pool. Um, so. Really, a, you know, a digital token is, is a right to some asset uh, held held by some token issuer. So, in in short, and this is my not my last slide, um, programmable money is about attaching conditions to a payment. Um, so, it's attaching, um, um, you know, it's enforcing rules about that transfer of money. So, I'll talk about some of the properties of programmable money, which sort of brings this brings this out. So first of all, constraints can be applied to attributes of a payment. Uh, so first one is constraints can be applied to when a payment is made or when a transfer is made from a sender to receiver. So you might put have a constraint on there that the that particular uh, token or let's call it money, that money can only be sent after a particular point in time. Or maybe it can only be sent uh, before a particular point in time and then it can't be sent. Uh, the next one is the amount, so you might have constraints on the amount, so you can only you can only send less than a certain amount, or you can only send more than a certain amount. Um, you can have restrictions on the sender, so you might say only people in this organisation with this role can send money. Uh, only um, you know this group of people, um, you know this set of addresses, this subset of addresses can send money. Uh, and then the last one there, in terms of the attributes of the actual payment itself, is who can receive the money. So you could put constraints on the money saying only these particular people, or maybe this organisation, or set of organisations, or, or, um, or particular members of the community can receive that payment. So constraints can be applied to attributes of, of a payment. Uh, but constraints can also be applied to attributes which aren't part of the payment. So we talked about sending money, transferring money from a sender to receiver, but there's external uh, data which these constraints can be applied to. So these might be prices or something, so prices of some stock or prices um, which you know, might be shares, it might be prices of um, um, some goods sold on an online store. Uh, it could be some event, so some supply chain event, um, so you know, re releasing of goods. Um, or, you know, in, in our, I work for Digital, so it's you know, releasing of grain. Um, it could be some news item, it could be some weather event, um, it could be you know, some flight information, so you see people talking about flight insurance, so it's attaching some, con uh, you attach constraints uh, to some non-payment data. Uh, and in programmable money, constraints can be added and removed. So I can put a constraint on the money and I send it to someone uh, and then uh, once they receive it, so so may, maybe maybe the constraint is it can only be spent at these particular stores, uh, and once they've received it, then they can spend it wherever they like. They've got different suppliers, or maybe it stays on. Maybe maybe after that particular transfer, it's it's that constraint is applied, and it can only be held within this closed system. So this is similar to the, the previous one. The constraints can be extended. So basically you can take uh, a form of programmable money which has these constraints on it 
and then you can, in, in programming terms, extend it, but basically you're adding more constraints over the top of it. Uh, or maybe you're loosening constraints over the top of it. So you could have a, a, a form of money um, which might have the constrictions about when it's applied and then you put more constrictions about who it can be sent to. Um, I mean, any, any one of those sort of combinations of, of constraints. So we've talked about constraints a lot, about enforcing rules about these transfers, but another, I think, an important point about programmable money uh, is it's done in an atomic transaction, which, which in, in computing terms, it's, it's either the transaction's done or it's not done. Uh, and this can be more than just a simple transfer of um, an, a token from one person to another. It could be a much more complicated exchange of multiple tokens which represent multiple assets uh, depending on external data, payment data, um, and it either happens or, or it doesn't. So the, that atomic transaction piece uh, is, is pretty key. Uh, particularly when you start comparing it to, um, so yeah, when you start talking to people in the financial industry, and particularly in Australia, where you have the new payments platform coming out, and I'll be able to send you money right now, and you'll get it in your bank account in less than a minute. Like, why, do you, why would you want anything else? Why, why would you want to have money on, on Plasma? Uh, well, the answer is that that's only just one, um, that, that particular payment is transferring the, the, the money, but if you, if you wanted to enter some more complicated arrangement where you wanted some delivery versus payment arrangement, where you're exchanging some digital asset, some tokenized asset for uh, tokenized dollars, say, in, our, in, in say, an Australian case, uh, then you can have a contract to enforce that and, and do it in, in one transaction, so one atomic transaction. So it's a uh, very important point um, and, a, and a key distinction between you know, existing payment rails. And the last property there is, is directly controlled. So by this it means if you hold the private key, then you're in control of that asset. So you can sign the transaction, broadcast it on the network, uh, and then it, it'll, it'll propagate, which is very very different to the way you currently do a payment. Effectively, you're sending an instruction to your bank or financial institution, uh, who then puts an instruction onto the uh, the various payment networks and payment schemes. Um, so you're instructing your bank to do something on your behalf, while in, in the programmable money piece, which is sort of more a, a generalised term for um, um, or you know, tokenising. Um, dollars or assets on, on a blockchain, uh, you're, you're in direct control. You don't have this intermediary uh, who may or may not uh, act on that construction. So, any questions so far? Because before I get into some use cases, yep. Uh, yeah, you were talking about getting things that are generally off chain, like weather, yep. stock information. Um, is, are there any issues with centralized oracles, or are you looking at decentralized oracles? Uh, so the question is, is there any issues with getting data on chain from um, centralised or decentralised oracles? Um, no, am I personally looking at those? No, but there are people who are doing it. Um, so for example, for those lucky enough to go off to Cancun this weekend or next week, um, you can get insurance on your plane trip. So they have a source, I can't remember what it was like, uh, there's, a, there's a, a source from some uh, flights, I can't remember the name of the place, but effectively they're, they're offering a, a source of information about whether a flight was delayed or not. And they're using that as the oracle uh, to basically the condition of whether they, they pay money out or not. Um, I think one, probably one point, I guess your point is, um, you, know, you know, it's not decentralised, you know, they've got these centralised data sources, how can you trust them? Well, that's that's true. Like, as soon as you get off the chain, you, you, need, a, you need a trust element. So that data is going to be sourced from somewhere uh, to get it on the chain. So yeah, you can you can't get away from trust in, in those external oracles. Excuse me. Yep. It sounds like more of a bank guarantee arrangement than you usually do. Um, banks do hold um, and release it at certain events. Sort of. That's one of the. So we'll go to the use cases now, and maybe. So so just on a very high level. This is what programmable money is and the, the properties of it. So let's go through some of the use cases and how, how it could be applied. Uh, so one is charity donations. Um, so you might want to make a donation to a charity and you might want uh, to ensure that you know, the payments uh, are done 
in a particular, you know, um, payments are made within a certain time, or payments are made to um, uh, particular um, organisations, or maybe payments aren't made to particular organisations. Um, the the other example here, which you know, governments talk about, is social welfare. So, uh, social welfare given out, and you, know, you can only you can only buy it on good things, not bad things. Um, but I, I prefer the charity example for that for that one. So the constraint there is about where you can where you can spend it. Uh, delivery versus payment. I talked a little bit about that. That's that atomic transaction piece. So at Agri Digital, we're uh, looking at um, agricultural supply chains. So we're looking at agricultural commodities. So initially, we're looking at grain. So effectively, we're creating a, a tokenizing grain. So that's the the asset. Um, and then we're looking at facilitating the exchange of that asset. So say um, a farmer's you spent the last year growing that asset and they're selling it to a buyer and you've got this exchange of money from the buyer to the grower so it's this exchange of this um, digital uh, digital title uh, with this digital token which is rights to, to, to money representing money um, and you can do that within a smart contract which ensures that's done in one atomic transaction so that's delivery versus payment which you can't do using something like um, NPP or a traditional payment schemes uh, that's something that so delivery reverse payment for those in the financial world. So that's um, and in, the, in the share market and the, the clearing and settlement of shares effectively is ensuring that delivery reverse payment and putting those guarantees. And that's like big, expensive, complicated systems. Uh, crowdfunding. I didn't, I didn't want to put ICO, but you know. <laughs> um, so you could put constraints on if you haven't raised a certain amount, then it it'll automatically get sent back to the. Uh, the people who contributed money, um, um, you could put constraints that if the money is not spent or the, after a particular point in time, you could put constraints that the money isn't, you know, you, you know, a certain amount has to be held for a year before they could um, run off with it. Um, so there's various um, conditions you could put on in a, in the in a crowdfunding use case. Uh, escrow, which, which you just talked about earlier. So escrow is about having. Um, Putting, putting money in a, in a pot basically uh, and then having different parties being authorised to, to instruct on that or, or to act on it. So this gets quite interesting in, in a blockchain space. So if you have these tokens, uh, in Ethereum speak, you can have externally owned accounts, so basically people controlling these addresses. Um, so you can have a third party or third parties, um, you can have multiple people um, controlling that particular asset. But I think where it gets really interesting is you can actually permission or escrow money and be controlled by a smart contract. So rather than an individual person who can um, has permission to send, so we go back to sending an amount of money to a receiver at a point in time, you could give that control over to a smart contract who enforces the rules. Yes? Just another question because yep. I was in an export form before. Yep. So So, yep. Yeah, so the example is uh, in the export world, you have a, a, a certifier comes in, certifies that uh, you know, the goods are legit and therefore the bank will release the funds. So in this case here, you could have a smart contract uh, and then you permission the, the third party certifier and they, they basically call the contract and say, yep, it's good. And the contract's built in there saying, well, not anyone could just sign it off. Only these set of certifiers can sign it off and if they if they sign it off, then the funds are free to go. So that's a that's a great example. Um, so you pretty much covered that bit off for me <laughs> um, of, of an escrow. So you, you've tied you've tied some funds up, uh, and you want a third party to sign it off. But it doesn't have to be a, a third party. Like it could be another smart contract, which is you know dependent on another smart contract. So you can end up as uh, as Bucky likes to say, a, a box of Lego. Yeah. Uh, auctions, so you could have a piece where it's a bit like an escrow, you, you put money in, how do you know that the, the bidder's got the funds? Um, so like if, you, if, you work, if you've gone for an Ethereum name service, has anyone, anyone signed up to an Ethereum name service? 
few people. Um, you you basically put a bid in, you put some money in some ether in a, in a pot, and then the winning bid, um, their, their money gets taken, and the rest get their money refunded. So that's an, an example of um, constraints about that transfer. Uh, loyalty points. Um, I'll put this over that one. Direct debits. This is. So new payments platforms coming into Australia next year. Um, so you better do what they call direct credits. You better push money. So a sender can push money, um, but you won't be able to pull money. So direct credits is basically enabling, say, a utility, um, you know, your, your phone provider or your, or your electricity provider, to come and take money out of your account. So yes, this can be done in the program or money form. You can have you can permission people. In fact, it's available natively in, in, a, um, in, a, in a token contract. You can permission people to take funds out of your account. But you can make it more complicated than, um, you know, maybe they can only take money out after a particular point in time. Um, they can only take money out a certain number of times. There's all sorts of constraints you can, you can put in place. Uh, another example is maybe you can only transfer money to uh, people who have been gone through a, a KYC AML process. So rather than everyone having to go through that mm -hmm. um, that process, you've got a, 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 a third party who authorise, yep, that person's legit, and as they move that money, uh, gets, as they spend their money around at different places, they go, well, I don't need to KYC AM elements. I can see that that's already been done as a, another use case, another example. So that's like a sort of a whole set of use cases. Um, so we've sort of gone through well, what is programmable money, which, um, which is really we're talking about tokens uh, and some of the use cases. Uh, so how could you do it? Now I have a, a more complicated uh, model, which I won't go into here, but basically you could set something up between, um, I've called it asset holders up the top, but um, you know, they could be financial institutions or banks, let's call it banks. And the settlement institution, you know, that could be a central bank. Uh, and you could have basically a, a contract which ensures that the token holders down the bottom um, are holding tokens to, uh, to any asset, but let's just say it's Australian dollars. So basically you could have set up a model where the, the asset, um, basically the banks at the top would issue tokens representing Australian dollars based on deposits coming in from the, from the uh, asset holders. Um, now, this more complicated model, you, you have the problem of how do you transfer money between the banks, so that's why you've got the, the third party settlement institution. Now, I won't go into that model in detail uh, because that's going to take too long. Uh, and you know, trying to get a central bank and the financial institutions all working together is just um, yeah, going to take too long. Too long for me, anyway. Uh, so, open bank token. So, um, so this is really about, well, how can we push the boundaries? How can we start leveraging? How, how could some of those use cases we talked about earlier uh, be leveraged? Like, there's a whole new ecosystem. There's a whole, there's a whole new businesses and whole new services which can be can be operated on. Um, and having having a digital dollar, which um, you know is pegged to our, the currency we account for, a unit of account, um, is, is a valuable thing in my mind. So I was like, well, why don't I just do it? Um, so that's sort of the challenge. Now, I, I, I thought about this about four weeks ago, and the plan was to issue an Australian dollar on the public Ethereum network by this meeting. And unfortunately, I've failed. Um, but I'm not far off. So uh, I'm hoping this year uh, I'll be able to issue uh, an Aussie dollar token, um, which is backed by Australian dollars in, a, in, in a, an Australian bank account. Uh, and yeah, that's really going to push the boundaries, I think. Um, so the regulators are going to get their head around it, uh, the bank's going to get their head around it, and then I guess all, all the community's going to get their head around it as well. So um, I've lost my speaker notes here, so I'm not to, uh, so, the, so the idea is to try and create a first version, which is quite so if you went to a bank and said, oh, I want to go and issue an Aussie dollar, uh, and it's going to be sent to anyone, so a bit like a tether, uh, yeah, they're going to freak out. So, well, you know, you get bad actors there. So, um, you're not going to get very far. 
So my proposal is to create a token which can uh, only be used by the great people in the Sydney Ethereum community because we, because we're we're all good. The banks will, the banks will love us. <laughs> um, but the idea is to come up with a it's really an experiment, like a closed closed loop system. Um, and there, there are a few other reasons why I might want to do that as well. Um, and maybe I'll go through the process of how it actually works to, to make, make it a bit more sense. So, token holder, anyone, anyone out there, um, can register an address uh, in, the, in their wallet. Um, and then at the moment, who, who's got uh, SID Ethereum tokens? A few people. I'll talk about a little bit more about that, so don't worry. If you don't have them, you haven't missed out. Uh, but effectively, so a few months ago I um, issued a SID Ethereum token. Basically you put your... Let's, let's do this now. So you put your public address in the introduction field of your SID Ethereum profile. Uh, this is not to be confused with your meetup bio. Um, <laughs> some people put it in there, I don't pick that up. It's got to be, it's got to be in the SID Ethereum introduction and you can put other stuff in there. You can put a spiel like I'm really good and here's my address, uh, it'll pick it up. Um, so, um, so basically, um, so I run a program which looks for any new members, picks up that address and issues a thousand tokens. Uh, and then for each meetup, so everyone who's come tonight who's, who's registered and I'm sure, you, I'm sure you're all all did register and weren't on the wait list and came in. Um, uh, I'll issue, I think it's 2,000 tokens. So it's on the main net. Yep. Uh, in fact, you can see it on the main net. Uh, there's 41 people have, have got token holders now. Uh, now, the original idea for this was to try and get people to use tokens, to move it around, like it's this free thing, it doesn't, it's not worth anything. Um, you know, people can experiment and transfer it around. Well, you're all a bunch of hoarders. <laughs> Not a single person has done a single transfer. There. Um, it is worthless. Like I can print as many as I like. Um, in fact, I think uh, to encourage it, uh, I would like, and maybe this could be a little community thing. It'd be nice to write a smart contract where if you transferred money into it, you got twice the amount of tokens back, just to encourage people to do a transfer. Um, but you can only do it once. So maybe, maybe it might be one of your classes, Bobby, you can do a, do a little, little project there. Um, so, so if you've registered your address there, then if you send a bank transfer into the account um, with this identifier, which is that number up the top there, so that's your um, uh, meetup um, identifier, then I, I can basically look at the new deposits, look at that number, look up your address and issue your tokens. Um, and basically, um, I've got the program half written to do that. So I've got all the, the, the blockchain contracts, all open source. You can have them through the, the, um, the repo. Um, I'm just working on the bank side. That's, as you could have guessed, is the, is the slower side. Um, but I think this is a good example of the constraints you can, you can put in place. So the idea is that once you've transferred the money, money into the token issuer's bank account, have a program that's look for those new deposits, issue the tokens, and, and away you go. Um, but the there, it is constrained, so you can only, only transfer money to other um, people that put deposits in. The main reason is I need your BSB and account number. Like if I, I don't know, get, uh, get sick of this or maybe some regulators come after me or uh, someone, you know, I, I get in trouble, I can, I can liquidate the thing basically and pay everyone out and pay the token holders out. And plus it keeps it in a nice closed experiment. So. You know, the banks get much more comfortable when you say, well, it's only constrained to the good people at Ethereum, um, and they've, they've already paid money into their account, therefore they've come through KYC and AML. It's all very safe, relax. Nothing bad can happen. Uh, there are a few other constraints to put in place. So this is some examples of the constraints. So this is all written to the constraints into the smart contract. You can't hold more than a thousand tokens. So you can't hold more than a thousand dollars. There can't be more than $10 million on issue and I'm the only one who can issue them. Um, so that gets around some, uh, that, gets, a, get, that uh, gets around a few legal issues. Um, the withdrawal process is basically, uh, you call a withdrawal function on the contract, I pick that up and then return the funds basically. 
um, for the transfer. Uh, a little bit of the architecture for any um, at a higher level. Um, effectively, I've got a process in the middle here, which is a bridging between the Ethereum network out here uh, and the bank account, the bank APIs, which I'm trying to work through at the moment. So I talk about programmable money all the time, all, all the way through tonight, but you can replace money with an asset. So you can, with these tokens, you can create programmable assets. So at Agri Digital, we're doing grain, so you can create programmable grain. You can create programmable coal. You can create programmable financial instruments. You can create programmable hours. Anything of value, basically, you can program. Uh, and to me, that's the real value of why you want to do this. Why? Um, Jeremy over there slaving away on trying to get plasma to scale. Um, you know, why, why can't you just use the payments network? Because you can't do all those, all those things. You can't put those constraints and those other properties on a traditional payments. You're busting to ask another question. Right? <laughs> yeah, so how do you map the real estate assets because there's a lot of around that? How do, how do I map uh, who, who owns the money to what's on the blockchain? Real estate? Yeah. Um, so it's got nothing to do with real estate? No, I mean, if we replace that all $40 with the value of the uh, land, which is... Yeah, so if someone, so, so, someone, so the question is, how does it work with, with real estate? So say someone had a token of, I don't know, hell, 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 sold some token, and I'm sure the lawyers would freak out, but say someone um, had a token for the rights to some land or something, then, yeah, then you've got... One, one token which is an asset which is land and you have another token which is Aussie dollars which is the right to the money in, in the bank account I'm holding uh, and then you can exchange that. What about the legalities of yeah. the other side? Well that's, what, that's why we're doing the experiment. Let's push the boundaries. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's stir things up. Um, so I've already talked about the Ethereum token. Um, so if you haven't haven't already and you, you'd like some free tokens, um, put your put your address in, and then I'll, I'll run it. I'll, I'll run it over the weekend probably, um, and issue out your tokens. It'd be nice if someone did a transfer. Um, to uh, um, well, it's pretty easy to work out who, who's got what, but yeah, maybe maybe we could whip up a quick contract to return return the funds back. Uh, so I'll put these slides up, but there's, yeah, my GitHub repo's got all sorts of stuff in there. Um, so more information on the program or money. It's got the, that open bank token I talked about. That's all open source. Uh, so you can review that code, and I've got more code coming in. Um, there was a lot of the stuff on the early piece around the um, program or money piece came out some technical workshops called FinTech Australia. That's up there. Uh, the, that more complicated model, which I didn't talk about, is also up there. Uh, and the, the meetup token is also uh, on, the, on the repository. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, we might. Uh, I'll get Sean's going to be the mic runner for me. Okay, so, the way that you describe programmable money, uh, it's that the rules follow the money around. Uh, can, which, yep. uh, I mean, it seems to me to be closer to. The, uh, the, the Bitcoin UTXO model and the, the, the rule that's associated with the transaction output, uh, except it doesn't really follow that output around after the next transaction happens, you know, well, versus well, uh, Ethereum where every, the money always stays inside one contract that is enforcing the rules. So can you sort of talk about the implementation aspect of that and which it's closer to or which you want something yeah. that's completely different from either the Ethereum smart contract model mm -hmm. Or the UTXO model. Yep. So um, yeah, I'm an organizer of the Ethereum meetup. So no surprises. I've picked Ethereum. Um, so yeah, it is an Ethereum smart contract. Uh, so the rules around you can't hold more than a thousand tokens, or you can't, there can't be more than ten million dollar issue, is written into the smart contract. So that's that's like a, a non-transferable rule. Like that's like that that applies forever. Um, but then you can do things like someone could take that token and extend it and put their own rules on it. Or, heaven forbid, they could even relax the rules. Um, so you could you could take you, you could basically put money in. So you, know, so you put a couple of grand in there, 
Um, but then you could tie, you could put that ownership in another contract, which was a whole new token. So you can extend it. You can you can you can chain these things together. Yeah. Uh, love your idea and congratulate your endeavour. Yeah. Are you concerned at all that ASIC would view this as some sort of non-cash payment facility? Yeah. Are you concerned? That it is a non-cash payment facility. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a low-value non-cash payment facility. Is it something for which you need a license to conduct? Um, no. <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass any lawyers sitting around. <laughs> As part of part of this fund, seeing what's possible. Hi. Uh, so, um, having the constraints on money, if I was going to receive it, yep. I would perceive it as having less than one dollar worth for each dollar. Yep. Uh, it's non fungible. Correct. Yeah. So you might say, uh, yeah, money in Nick's new startup is not worth one dollar to me because it is credit risk on on that entity. Correct. Yep. And what's to stop you? Flying to the Bahamas and transferring all the uh, nothing. Thank you, Tom Dallas. <laughs> um, I mean, you could put more complicated structures, like um, uh, custodian structures, in place. Um, but this is this is a part-time in the evening endeavour, and that's why I'm asking all those questions, Bucky, in the evenings. If any, anyone's on the Telegram group, um, uh, that's where all the, the, the technical chat about how to pull this off is actually done. Uh, first one, when's your ICO? There's no, there's no ICO. <laughs> no, no, but seriously. Um, how do you think digital identity plays into programmable money yeah, and good programmable question. assets? Good question. I, identity's hard, and I try and avoid it. Um, but doing something like this, you can't really avoid it. Um, so I guess initially, it's a small little thing. We get we can get an exemption because we're a, 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 a low-value, non-cash payment facility. The amount on the right back is very correct. Um, so we don't have to do KYC and all, but to, um, to expand it to more, so we can have something bigger and more, more use, you know, can be used by companies like Avery Digital and you know, Athera and all, all these other fintechs who are trying to build stuff, then we need to crack that one. Um, and I don't have the answers yet, but um, you know, our initial thoughts is you, you could have like a sort of like an oracle, um, which is sort of um, certifying that effectively white labeling addresses you know, those, those addresses are good. Or it could be controlled. So in this particular case, one way I guess I'm controlling that is you can only transfer money who's deposited money into the bank account. Therefore, you've come through the banking system. Therefore, you've been KYC okay, or uh, I know other platforms like Neo are uh, in building yep. uh, digital identity into it. Does Ethereum have some sort of uh, roadmap or something to uh, integrate? Well, Ethereum wouldn't because it's just this layer on the bottom and then people can put layers on top. So I guess that's probably the other key point. So this is like a... Um, yeah, there's well, there's there's Ethereum, there's Plasma, all these sort of low-level infrastructure, and then you can say, well, there's tokens, but then you can put a layer on top which might include identity, and eventually you get more and more complicated, and eventually you're building, you know, quite complicated, you know, whether it's supply chains or you know, um, you know financial instruments, etc. So, in the in Ethereum, we're still building out those layers, like we're still, you know, we're still really at the, the low-level layers, but. Um, this is really trying to push the boundaries and say, well, let's, let's put something out there. Any other questions? Just keeping a track of time. I still don't understand how you connect the banking to the actual Ethereum address. So, for example, you said yep. you transfer money from your bank account. Like yes. I could, for example, say, okay, my like I, I buy Ethereum on Coinbase. I transfer it to you, I tell you what so my ESP number is, but yeah. I, I don't understand what you meant with like yeah, conversion. So, uh, so, so the electronic funds transfer at the moment goes through something called direct entry, and it's very old, and you basically get 18 characters as a reference number. So ideally, you would put your Ethereum address in, but that's 40 characters. So to get around that, um, I'm using the Meetup. In fact, I'm using Meetup as an identity system, I guess which answers to your question. Um, you're, you're putting your public so then in fact that's what we've done with the Ethereum token so 41 people have already done it put their address in meetup 
Um, hopefully it's not a high value either, <laughs> Waller and Nick. Um, but put their address in and they receive, receive, the, receive the token. So it's a bit the same thing. You put your uh, meetup ID and through it goes. Now, next year when in, new, the new payments platform comes in, you get 280 characters. That's more than enough for an Ethereum address. Uh, so you'd be able to send a payment and within a minute or two, the token would be issued. Where would I send the payment to? To a, a bank account, which is still to be set up. All right, and then it would go to the blockchain. Yep. Then, okay. There's some questions at the back. I don't want to answer Bobby's questions, they're too hard. <laughs> oh, hi. Um, so I was a bit confused. Is the idea you want to have a token that's fixed to the Aussie dollar? Correct. Um, how exactly does the mechanism of the pricing of the token work? How, how do you fix it to the... Uh, uh, basically the by assets held in a bank account. So rather, so there are other models, so you can do... Um, you can do models where you've sort of got collateral, you know, maybe it's in Ether, maybe it's in Bitcoin, and you've got this complicated pricing system. Like this is simple, it's just money held in the bank account versus tokens on issue. And there are some banks who do have APIs where you can authorise third parties to go and access certain information. So ideally, I'd find a bank who would have an API where I can permission people to look at the balance. So anyone can go onto the website and reconcile the balance to tokens on issue. Um, can I just ask something else? Um, so, is there like a specific amount of um, assets in reserve that you need for a certain amount of tokens issued? Like uh, one dollar. Oh, okay. Yeah. One dollar is one token. Um, you could could do it down to cents, but I think that just makes it a little bit more complicated because then you've got to put cents in the smart contract, and then it looks confusing. So, like you're using one dollar, it's a hundred tokens, and I thought it might be just be confusing. So I thought I'd just go with a one for one to the dollar. As, a, as an experiment, what sort of experiment is it? You're just throwing some ingredients into a petri dish and see what happens, or do you have some objectives that you'd like to see? Uh, well, ultimately you want to grow this, so... Yeah, but it'd be nice to get to that more complicated enabling model, so, so you know, businesses, you know, obviously on Fintech Australia, so looking at Australian businesses, but, you know, there's global businesses. We start building this ecosystem, and I'm obviously bought into, uh, you know, Ethereum and the broader blockchain and what things could do, so... Um, so I'm sort of using this as a stepping stone to try and get people along the journey. You know, get the get the regulators um, along, get the financial institutions, you know, get the community at large um, along along the journey. Because you can't just jump to the you know some end state. It's just too too much. The microphone is coming. Thanks, Sean, for doing the running. It's come all the way from New Zealand to do this. I know that there is a US dollar tetra, which basically is a US dollar in crypto form. Yep. So why are the all the other currencies not yet tokenized? Because it's it's, it's so easy to, to do it. Yep. That's what I asked. Why hasn't that one done? Why not me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something's stopping it. You can do it. Are you looking for something more? Like, like if there was a reason why you couldn't do it, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's others. Yeah. I mean, Ted is probably the most well, well known one. Yeah. Hi. Um, have you had a look at the IBAN address? Yeah. Does it work? Oh, I, I don't think they should have put that in there. Yeah. They shouldn't have put that. Okay. This is an alternate form for Ethereum addresses. Yeah, no, I think they're better. Like I think like the Ethereum name service is a much better identity system. Like I think they've, they've tried to put banking identity in on the blockchain, and that's where I originally started from this. So I, I worked on it in the new payments platform for a year, uh, working on ISO twenty o twenty two messages, which are these big massive messages with lots of identity in it, and I was trying to shoehorn it in, and then the realization is no, uh, this is this is different. Like the identity on the blockchain is different. You don't need all those other 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 bits, um, and then. It, once you, once you let go of trying to shoehorn in existing systems and move into the, you know, a new way of thinking, then it, it frees you up. And um, you know about the new scams happening on the ENS? Uh, no, but I'm sure there's scams everywhere. This is the Wild West, ladies and gentlemen. Hidden, so. hidden characters. Oh, hidden characters, <laughs> okay.
what's going to happen to one one dollar holding in your account when the bank charges you a twenty dollar account fee? So I'm like, uh, so yeah, I just have to wear that. But hopefully they'll give me some interest as well. <laughs> How much interest do you reckon they'll give me? Point zero one percent. Um, so, what's your like real use case for what you're trying to get out of it? So, if you say USD Tether, yeah. people mostly use it because you can interact the purchasing of Bitcoin and sale into a Tether token, and then quickly buy in and out of it without having to go back to the actual US dollar. So yeah. Can... So, I talked about the use cases earlier, but I guess they're a bit further out. Um, you know, probably, probably a, a shorter term use case could be um, you know, used on exchanges. Uh, and then particularly if you added in the KYC ML piece, like that is a nightmare for the exchanges at the moment, um, trying to do that. So if you could come up with something where relieve the, the burden they've got on trying to identify people and they could they can see the money coming through in a trusted source, then that, that's like probably it's probably probably the use case with a sort of an immediate value. There's there could be other smaller ones, but um, but really it's trying to build to that those bigger use cases. So Agriculture and supply chains, or um, you know, mining, or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Sorry. So, when you say agriculture and mining, like, how is that different from how you interact with the bank at the moment? So, say I wanted to sell you a thousand tons of coal. Um, so you can you can buy it and you get your bit of paper, um, but then you need to give me money. How do we ensure that that exchange is going to happen? So what if those thousand tons of coal was a token on the on the blockchain, and therefore those that and we can have a contract to inform enforce it so that's done in an atomic transaction. Okay, cool. So it's, re it's removing that counterparty risk, which is which is a big problem. Unfortunately, I don't know the stats off my head. I'm sure Brody does. Five hundred billion. Five hundred billion. In just in agriculture for supply no, chain. That's the whole supply chain. Whole supply chain. Five hundred billion of people not getting paid. Globally, not just Australia. Um, okay, well we might move to um, shout outs then. So for those who haven't been here before, uh, maybe if you want to do a shout out, uh, come up the front and then I can judge how long you get. <laughs> we, we get a lot, we shorten it up. If it's uh, not too many, you can have a bit longer. Uh, so if you've got a project you're working on, you're trying to hire some people, um, I don't know, you're trying to raise some money, you're, uh, I don't know, you want to complain about something, um, you're you get, uh, let's say, let's say you get two minutes and we might shorten it up because there's a lot of people. All right, Lucky. Hi everyone, my name's Lucky. Um, I'm actually here from Brisbane uh, with my business partner, Tabor. And we're working on a fintech startup based on bringing bonds to the blockchain. So at the moment, for anyone to get access to fixed income anywhere in the world, Usually you have an average uh, minimum parcel size of about $500,000. This prices a lot of investors out of the market. And on top of that, when you do get access to bonds, it goes through so many different hands and there's just fee after fee after fee after fee. We already have the technology today with the Ethereum network to make this process entirely transparent, remove the fees, decentralize it, make it so that anyone anywhere in the world, no matter their status, income, wealth, any sort of uh, tag you can put on a person can be removed so that you can get access to fixed income returns, guaranteed uh, interest each year, no matter who you are. So that's what our business is sort of focusing on. Uh, if you're interested in that, the platform is called Labris. Uh, so you can check out our Facebook page, website, anything like that. And uh, for any questions, you can come and have a chat to me or Tabor at the end. Thank you. Hi, uh, two things. Um, first is that there's a MCIC, that's a unit, UNSW blockathon in November. Um, 24, 25, 26 or something like that. Um, it would be good if we get more people building projects for that. 
And as a bonus, you'll get one sexy token from me <laughs> if you join up. <laughs> um, that's the first one. Second one, um, I'm building the Pocky Poopa token tele um, teleportation service. And this will allow tokens to be transferred on the blockchain without the account holders holding ethers. So, for example, if you're in a university environment, you can issue your own tokens for payments in the canteen or whatever, and um, the account holders don't have to go out and buy ethers in order to use your system. So, um, and we're going to be using that for Gaze coin. There'll be no ICO for BTTS. It's going to just charge a small fee. Um, but you have to build something into your smart contracts. So on top of the ERC20 tokens. Um, but once you use it, then you just pay a small fee on top of the Ethereum network fee, which the service provider will hold, uh, will, will pay. Um, that's it. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Antoine and this is Andrew. We work on Devery, a uh, product verification uh, protocol. Uh, and the problem we're trying to solve is this. Let's say you want to buy a pair of Nike shoes or a leather bag on eBay or Amazon. There's no way for you to, to know whether that's a legitimate or a counterfeit unless you rely on the seller's product description or their reputation um, from previous sales. And this is a huge stumbling block for the e-commerce industry because people are very hesitant to purchase luxury goods online. And the main reason is because the whole system relies on trust. You need to trust that the product is as described and you need to question whether a deal is too good to be true. So at Devery, we're trying to remove trust from the e-commerce market. We want to empower consumers to independently ver verify whether a product they purchase is a legitimate pair of shoes from Nike or a legitimate watch from Rolex. And the way we're gonna do this is by using the blockchain. So we're gonna enable retailers and brands to um, mark whether a product that they've manufactured or that they're selling uh, comes directly from them. So if a third party seller sells that on, the consumer can then verify the signature attached to that product back with mm -hmm. the signature of the brand. Uh, currently our roadmap is, um, we're hoping to release an alpha of the protocol in December. And uh, we are being advised by Boki, who spoke earlier, and Doji Sun from Sentiment. So please come check us out at devry.io. We'll be uh, waiting around uh, after this meeting to, to chat to anyone interested. If you're interested in partnering with us, uh, we're working with a few e-commerce brands. Uh, thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is Kai Kwan. Um, the problem I'm trying to solve is that for all fiat currencies, you have interest rates. Interest rates are decided by the Reserve Bank or Federal Bank. Now with crypto, who decides the interest rate if I want to lend you crypto? So what I've done is that I created a deposit offer. So you can offer your crypto and we have people to bid interest rates for your crypto. And I'm going to have an ICO on the 30th of October this month. The, the link is actually at token.depositoffer.com token.depositoffer.com Thank you. Thanks. Uh, a lot of you know me already. I'm Ron van der Maiden, uh, Professor of Computer Science at UNSW. Uh, this is just to let you know that, uh, I mean, if, uh, you've probably heard me talk before about the seminar series that I'm running. Uh, we've got another meeting coming up on Monday with a speaker from IBM talking about database aspects of blockchain. Uh, furthermore, we're getting uh, more organized across the university uh, with respect to blockchain activities happening not just in the School of Computer Science, but also people on law and business are starting to take an interest in this area. So I've set up an interest group. We can't call it a center yet because uh, that involves putting up an application to the university and going for a long, 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 long approval process. Uh, so that may eventually happen, but at the moment we've just got a web page uh, that's showing the activities in the blockchain space around UNSW, so just to give you some idea of uh, the types of people that are involved. Um, staff here, we've got people from the School of Computer Science, we've got uh, people from the Law School, there was a very nice meeting that I attended 
uh, organized by uh, Dimity Kingsford Smith from the law school uh, just yesterday, where we had all the Australian regulatory bodies and Treasury and uh, ACC and others uh, represented at a, uh, just a, a workshop to talk about regulatory issues relating to blockchain technologies. It was Chatham House Rules, I can't tell you anything about who said what, but there will be some information released about that uh, eventually. So, um, Bucky's already mentioned that we've got at the, uh, if you look under events here, uh, that we've got a hackathon coming up. Thanks. Okay, so that's, that's, that's linked into this page. Um, the other thing that uh, is interesting to mention, uh, if you go to projects, um, oops, that's the hackathon. Maybe if you go back and go to the projects link, Unify Rewards. Okay, this is uh, a project we've got happening. We had a uh, company called Loyalty X come to, to us uh, saying we want to do a trial of a, uh, an, Ethereum, an Ether based uh, loyalty program. Uh, at the university. So right now uh, there's about 500 students enrolled in this program uh, and uh, when we go to the cafe at the university or to the supermarket that's at the university, a number of the shops at the university, we can get some loyalty points. Uh, it's just being stored in a database to start with and at the very end of the program you can cash out your loyalty points uh, in Ether. Uh, so it's just a trial to see how do the, uh, does this community of millennial students uh, react to this sort of capability to earn ether uh, by shopping at UNSW. Uh, okay, I mean, last thing, um, uh, getting organised here with respect to, to research, I'm also doing work to uh, try to assemble a group of uh, industrial partners to put in an application to the Australian Research Council for a, a research centre. So uh, if you happen to be from a, a company that uh, might be interested in partnering with the university uh, within this space uh, and uh, would be able to put up some money uh, for the, uh, the partner contribution, then we can leverage that with ARC money uh, and get some research activity happening within the university. Sorry, second round. So I'd like to call Daniel Barr out. He's running the MCIC Blockathon at UNSW. And if you are ICOing, you need resources to build your Ethereum project, you should sponsor this hackathon. Yeah, so thanks uh, Ron and Bucky also for supporting and endorsing the Blockathon. So, um, just to give you a rundown of what's happening, so as you can see, it's very similar to an ICO. We have a clock ticking until uh, the launch, <laughs> and um, uh, we have great sponsors and more sponsors coming uh, now. If you have an ICO or anything you want to promote, so please come talk to me. Um, we have amazing, um, amazing mentors like uh, the Grand Boki Puba, Satoshi Not Craig. Um, Way Wu Anderson and obviously the, the great Nick Allison, CTO of um, AgriDigital and uh, other cool startup entrepreneurs. So uh, it's going to be really, really nice. And if you, have, um, if you have a project that you want to work on, you don't need to wait only for the weekend and hack on it. You can actually come with your um, already kind of uh, beginning of project and it will give you probably a fair bit of advantage over people um, with uh, less ready project so please please come at any stage basically if you have a team or if you have no team just uh, apply online and come along basically we're bootstrapping the crypto economy Sorry. You can't have a third. Jeez. Third, third time. <laughs> and um, if you've got some ideas that you want to grow there will be the dev workshop starting at the Tyro Fintech Club when I come back from Cancun. And I'll be moving it to the evening, so it might be Wednesday or Friday evenings. Um, so you could come in with your idea and we could build on your idea and you can present that at the Blockathon. That's it. Uh, who's, who's got the next one? Luke. Uh, 
well, just in time organisation. So I don't know where the next one is or where it is. Uh, but thank you for, for coming along. Yep. Yeah. All oh, right. Good. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Nathan Waters, Guru's in C three room. Um, so I just got two quick things to say. Um, so there's. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about Singularity Summit. Um, Singularity. So, uh, if you've heard about Singularity University in the States, um, so they ran one in New, South, uh, in New Zealand, they're now running one in, uh, in Australia in February. Um, they've put the call out for, so they're looking for tech demos and they want to have like blockchains, so they're doing lots of deep tech stuff. Um, so they're looking for blockchain demos, if anyone has any working demos to present in February. Um, it'd be great to get in front of, these guys basically have, you know, Peter Diamandis, uh, Ray Kurzweil, all these crazy, massive, change the world, uh, multi-billionaires. Um, so yeah, reach out to me, just message me if you've got a tech demo to present. Um, and there's also a coupon code SU Ethereum for half price tickets. Um, and the other thing is um, I've been uh, asked by Consensus to actually run a, an event uh, mid-November, so potentially November 14th, uh, keep an eye on the meetup event. Um, we're, we're literally that close to getting Joseph Lubin to come out, um, and it would have been fucking massive. But it sounds like it's, it's going to be pretty much a, a, an event, uh, almost like a little mini sort of Ethereum. Um, so Kavita Gupta is uh, who heads up their $50 million blockchain fund for consensus. Um, so they're basically pairing up with uh, TechCrunch Battlefield in Australia, and so they're looking to do an event mid November. So keep an eye on that. And they're looking to invest a fair chunk of that into into the Sydney ecosystem. And actually, I just heard recently, our blockchain capital is also looking to invest a bunch of money into the, the Sydney ecosystem. So, lots of cool stuff happening. So, yeah, cheers. Thank uh, so, thanks everyone. I know it's getting getting late, so thanks for coming along, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, see you around. See you next time.